città che da cinque anni vive la guerra. La guerra è il risultato dell'oppressione. Del... della tirannia usate dal regime in risposta alle manifestazioni pacifiche che chiedevano la libertà. È una città che muore senza motivo, senza colpa, solo perché il pilota ha deciso di gettare il barile bomba in quella zona. Nonostante questo ci, si ostina a vivere e la città vive comunque esperienze democratiche, prova a vivere la libertà. Ci sono state iniziative come per esempio il Consiglio Comunale che nonostante le differenze tra i vari gruppi che lo controllano ha provato a sperimentare esperienze democratiche basate sull'espressione dei voti delle persone. Ci sono state certamente delle discussioni e controversie ma...
Xiaomi啊。Draft hashtag or is it it's oh, I did, yeah. Um I was still gonna do better than that. I was there. Let's use the main one. Just the main oh one. Yeah. Okay, to cool up the spy I sent you. <coughs> it's a different link. <laughs> so when the European <laughs> people are trying to. PDF for cooking.
Shibu announcement yesterday that they're moving away from New Year's. Pretty much all of news and politics. James, how are you? Nice to see you. You well? Good to see you. Yeah. How's the poll go? You must say no, right? Yeah, because yeah, they just bulked it up, didn't they, for the election, so... Yeah, of course. Okay. Oh, you'll do that. Okay, great. And then I can just, can I just move it? Oh, <laughs> okay, sure. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we're going to get going, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, the title of this session, Does the Rise of Closed Networks Spell the End for Social News Gathering? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Matt Cook from the Google News Lab. Um, we've got an expert panel who we'll introduce in a moment. This is a session brought to you by the First Draft News Coalition, which is a group of media organizations and startups that thinks about social networking, social media organizations and platforms, and how that affects what it means to be a journalist in the digital reality. Um, this is one of eight events uh, that the First Draft team are producing here in Perugia, and you can get much more by following the hashtag uh, IJF16, and we encourage you to add your views and thoughts and questions on that, and also much more on the First Draft News Coalition itself on firstdraftnews.com. That's the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, in a moment, we'll um, hear from the panelists and also we'll get a chance to hear from you and get some of your questions and your thoughts. Um, firstly, though, if we can go to the screen on the laptop, please, uh, we're going to see a very scientific poll that I've been conducting over the last couple of days. Um, most people say that decent surveys have to be 2,000 or more. I think we've got about 25 people on there so far. So, fingers crossed we see a few more uh, people joining that. But on there, that is the question we're looking at today, uh, which is, uh, do closed networks spell the end for social news gathering? Let's have a vote from you, please, in the room. And also add your questions and comments to the hashtag IGF16. We'll get to those. Okay. So... When I was a journalist four years ago, I could have understood how to use Twitter, just about. Uh, but now we hear of things like WeChat, Telegram, Snapchat, of course. The things have changed. Uh, the platforms where people are going to find out breaking news content at the moment's matter, they're evolving, aren't they? And we've got great panelists here to talk about that. If you can introduce yourself, let's start with you, Trusha. Uh, hi there. Shah Barrett, I'm mobile editor at BBC World Service, um, and I guess in the context of this panel, uh, one of the areas of my responsibilities is thinking about messaging strategy for uh, messaging app strategy for all of BBC News. Hi, I'm Mandy Jenkins. I'm the head of news at Storyful, and our entire business is social news gathering. So I really hope this doesn't actually spell <laughs> the end. It would be real, really troublesome for us. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anshal Mina, Director of Product at Midan, where we build a, a digital tools for a, a journalists working in global contexts um, for verification and translation. 
Um, and I'm also a researcher. I uh, was a visiting fellow at the Neiman Foundation, and I've been um, looking at um, especially Chinese and global social media trends um, since about 2011, um, and looking at you know, the shift to, to uh, private platforms as well. Great. So experts in their field are here today. We're going to get a chance to get questions from you. So if you um, think about that right now and also add your comments to the hashtag, as I said. Um, let's start with you, Iman, though. Sure. Things have changed. There are big uh, opportunities with social media platforms. Yeah. But now closed networks have come along, the likes of WhatsApp and others. What does that mean practically for you as a journalist? Sure. Um, should we check yeah, let's this? go to the laptop, please. Okay, great. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, refer to the slides as well. And I think, I think when we when we ask this question about um, the shift to closed networks, I'm going to move the laptop a little closer. Um, I think it's first important to ask how many of you remember um, AOL or ICQ. Um, Great, uh, probably a good chunk of you. It's, it, it's important to remember that closed networks have been a key part of the internet ecosystem since um, the internet has existed. We've had email listservs, we've had Telnet, we've had IRC chats, and then more recently AOL and ICQ, and that the, the emergence of, of private closed networks is just part of this trend, um, and that closed networks have always existed. And in many ways, um, you know, what, what I've been researching um, you know, Chinese internet advocacy um, actions, um, you know, the, their focus on searchable web platforms like Weibo and Twitter has, um, has obscured the fact that private networks have, have long been a key part of how people are organizing and having discussions online. And so a lot of my Weibo-based research was just uh, the starting point, like sort of a, um, a tip of an iceberg um, towards um, other questions when I would actually then go interview people, learn about the private conversations they were having on Chinese social networks. Um, and so Weibo was just the entry point. And so, and so, um, and so some of what I, you know, I'm looking at and what I want to you know, advocate for is that our, our focus on you know, tech platforms and, and using APIs, searchability, algorithms, um, needs to be complemented by more qualitative methods as well, including you know, interviews and relationship building and, um, and other, other um, qualitative methodologies. So, um, you know, when we're talking about the move to closed networks, I think it's really important to be very specific about which closed networks we're talking about. Um, Matt alluded to a few of them, but you know, so much of the conversation we have WhatsApp, we have WeChat in, in the Chinese-speaking world. There's Kakao Talk in Korea, Wang Wang, which is a, another an e-commerce-based messaging app in in uh, China. Um, you know, it's obviously you know Facebook groups. There's Slack. There's um, there's Google groups. There's Snapchat. There's Line. There's Viber. There's Signal. There's Telegram. There's Kick. There's iMessage, and umpteen others. Each of these are popular in different countries and contexts for very different reasons. Kakao Talk is very popular amongst Koreans. It's, it's a Korean-based site. Um, Koreans like to use um, uh, local media, um, and apps like WhatsApp are more popular in, in lower, um, in, you know, in uh, a lower bandwidth contexts because the app is designed for for low bandwidth phones and um, and um, uh, you know, people with um, people who might not be using us. us uh, maybe like $100 uh, or even $20 uh, phones. Um, things like Signal and Telegram are popular because of their encryption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so when we're talking about these, um, I want to, you know, I'm just focusing today just on WeChat, and I think um, the other folks on, on, on the panel are talking about the other contexts in which they've operated. So WeChat is a private social network, closed social network in China. Um, it's, it's quite popular. Um, as, um, as, you know, is, as a way not just for chat, um, but also for hailing taxis, for e-commerce, for buying things at stores, buying things online. Um, you can check the weather. It's a whole app ecosystem within WeChat. So it's beyond messaging, but I'm focusing just on the messaging um, content of, of WeChat. <clears throat> I'm curious how many of you have scanned a QR code lately? How many of you have been to that Tumblr people scanning QR codes? .tumblr .com. It's a uh, um, if you check it out, it's completely blank. Um, <laughs> but if um, my uh, you know, a researcher I know, Christina Shi, um, she's argued that if you if you were to set up that Tumblr in China, it would be a, it would be a lot of people. You'd be scanning QR codes every single day. Uh, QR codes are incredibly popular in, in um, across China. Um, they're a primary mode of interaction with um, with WeChat, and I'll show a little bit of what that looks like. Um, um, and because WeChat, um, this is actually a scanning interaction. This is how people friend each other on WeChat. Um, you literally will have, uh, pull up a QR code on your phone, um, and then someone else will scan it. And there's a whole politics to this. Uh, Christina Shi has pointed out that there's literally a politics to being a QR code top or bottom. Um, and there are all kinds of decisions um, embedded in this, decisions around trust, decisions around, um, around you know, even pulling out your phone, around um, the in-person interaction. And I think it's this in-person part that's really important to ground ourselves in because it means that um, people are meeting each other in person. These networks are built on trust. 
Um, these networks are built on relationships um, and, um, and, and in many ways are fundamentally different from more open networks. This is um, Dr. Jue Ren, um, who is a researcher in Shenzhen, and I was um, recently there. Uh, Shenzhen is a um, city in, in the southern part of China that's just across from Hong Kong. Uh, you might have heard of it as a you know, site of um, when something is made in China, it's often made in Shenzhen. Um, so um, I'm, I'm doing research on uh, Chinese manufacturing and production um, for a story and for a presentation I'm going to give at, um, at CHI in, in San Jose in May. Um, and um, and you know, in order to navigate this space, you know, I had to show up in Shenzhen. I had to go interview people and, and discuss with them. Very traditional journalism. But I also needed to navigate digital space. The, the internet has shifted what hardware and manufacturing look like. And in order to do that, um, I couldn't simply search. You can't search WeChat. I couldn't, I couldn't dig through APIs and, and look for keywords. Instead, I had to speak with people like, um, like Jai Ren, who, um, who, has, who made introductions. She's, a, you know, she's based in Shenzhen. She's a journalist, researcher, and writer. She has many, many, many networks on WeChat. And so when I was curious, um, when I asked her about selfie stick production, she, um, you know, within, within a few minutes, she introduced me to a selfie stick, um, a selfie stick um, uh, basically a WeChat group, where 500 people are trading ideas about products and, um, and issues. This was not discoverable by any other means. Um, I literally needed someone to tell me that this group existed, and then to invite, and then not just that, but then to invite me into that group, to bring me into the circle of trust. And it was through her introduction that I was then able to have um, productive interviews both online, and then through meeting these people, then um, meeting with them offline as well, um, to talk about um, some of the ways that they're doing um, hardware and manufacturing. And so this, this I think, gets to, um, gets to you know, a point here, which I think, um, you know, I was watching the engaged journalism sessions this morning, and um, you know, Maliki Brown you know, used the phrase, good old journalism. Um, these are not new skills that we need to develop. These are simply skills that journalists have always had about relationship building, about trust, about cultivating sources. Um, and and uh, traditional journalism has always had the concept of the fixer. When you are um, arriving in a new context, in a new location, um, you work with a fixer who understands that context. They might be a journalist or researcher themselves. And I think, um, you know, theoretically, we can, we can apply this to the digital context, that there are digital fixers, people who are embedded in, in digital communities, who can, um, you know, beyond just simply translation, word for word translation, can introduce you to the local culture. They can move, you know, they can um, choose the humor, the dialect, inside knowledge, and help you understand and then introduce you to those spaces. And, and, and someone like Jairan, um, you know, played a key role in, in my understanding of that. And I'll be, I'll be tweeting out a few of these links. And so how does that scale? One, one, one question that we're asking at Medan is how do, how actually, how do you scale up you know, the, 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 these networks of trust, these networks of sources? And one, um, one of the projects that we're working on is called the Sources Database, um, and supported by the Open Technology Fund, where, um, where newsrooms can gather the sources that they're regularly um, relying on and trusting, and then aggregating the information that they're gathering about that source in a verification log that they can share with the other people on their news team. And then, and then code that and add keywords so that the next time someone goes to China to research selfie sticks, if they're part of my sources database, um, they also will know that they can reach out to Jaran um, and, and probably will need me to make that introduction because, again, these are networks of trust. And so um, the sources database, it's very early stage. Um, these are, um, this is not yet working software, but the ideas around it are basically about um, integrating with the journalist network practice and then, um, and then helping, them, you know, helping them aggregate and maintain institutional knowledge. And so I just want to close again on this, um, you know, on this slide because it's, I think it's important to, again, emphasize that um, you know, the, the reason, you know, the difference between AOL and ICQ of yesteryear and the, and the private networks of today is that so many, so many of them are based on mobile. Um, and, and many of them are based on mobile and mobile first environments um, in, in places like China, um, in, in East Africa, and um, in Latin America, where people, um, you know, their first experience of the, of the internet is through mobile phones. And so um, private networks also are based on trust. Um, the researcher Tricia Wang has written about geographies of trust in China where in, in a context where trust is very, um, very difficult to be had. Um, trust in institutions and trust in people is very low. And so um, these networks, the fact that there, there's so much friction to adding friends um, is a way of, of, of improving and developing trust amongst the people you add. And so as journalists, when we're thinking about navigating these communities, we have to think about cultivating trust, cultivating those sources, um, and having people believe that we're actually going to be good stewards of the content and the conversations that they're having. And then, you know, finally, what does mobile enable? Mobile enables in-person. 
networks um, to, to flourish and grow. Um, it's, not that, um, you know, it's not that in WeChat people don't um, make friends who, who they've never met, fr um, never met in person, but often those, those uh, boundaries of trust uh, really start um, by when you meet people and when you, um, you know, get to know them over time. And so, um, uh, so I think that's just important to keep in mind um, and uh, we'll be happy to talk more about that. Great, thank you very much. That was a really good introduction to the rest of today's uh, discussion. We talked about issues of process, trust, also, you talked about the different uh, geographies, particularly. I think that's really yeah. interesting. And in some regions, apps are number one, but in others, we might have even heard of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, for a global organization like the BBC, uh, where your story may come from any part of the world, you kind of have to be aware of the different apps and private and closed messaging apps that are relevant in, in different markets. We saw from Arne about the different examples of the platforms that are available. When it comes to it, though, on a daily newsroom duty, are these closed networks providing the content that you will find useful, or is it still on places like Twitter and Facebook and other places? Um, I think, well, before my current job, I used to run the BBC's UGC and social media hub uh, in their main newsroom. And one of the things that we were always very aware of was whilst increasingly people are sharing stuff on these open networks and social media, um, people's natural behaviors are just moving more into one-to-one -one messaging as well. Um, and I think it was the really big eye-opener came a few years ago when the, the London riots happened in the summer of, I think, 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst our team was uh, doing a lot of work trying to um, find stuff on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, um, it became very obvious that a lot of trust and the way you build that relationship then, um, on my phone, I've got a list of friends who I speak to and share my amusing anecdotes and hilarious photographs. Unusual for me to have a friend, BBC News, story full. How do you challenge or how do you get through that trust issue and how do you build that at the BBC? Well, I think it's sort of touching on what Mandy just said, that there is a sort of a long, long game here where you're trying to just build contacts and networks on these sorts of close platforms at multiple levels. So, you know, at one level, you know, we'll have a central BBC WhatsApp number, which is particularly useful for breaking news and reaching out to our existing audiences. But increasingly now, we're getting a lot of our correspondents to cultivate their own contacts through WhatsApp yeah. as well. So in the way that a correspondent, you know, is very comfortable with having their own Twitter account and just, you know, offering shout outs or asking for help on Twitter, they're uh, increasingly now trying to do, do the same thing with WhatsApp groups or broadcast lists inside WhatsApp. So one of our correspondents in Brazil, for example, came to me not too long ago saying, how can he use WhatsApp more effectively? And then one of the things we started talking through, and he realized that he knows, um, I can't remember exactly, I think it was his, his beat was particularly around crime and social issues. Um, and because he's a journalist and that's his beat, he had fantastic contacts in, you know, in, in the country who are experts in this field or work in the right agencies and so on. Um, and he realized that actually if he just pulled the relevant ones into relevant broadcast lists, and then whenever he's doing a piece, to just push out that piece to that broadcast list, but also use that broadcast list as a way of asking for help um, and engaging with them in that sort of WhatsApp community, then actually that's a really good, strategic, influential way of reaching the people who are then also know. I think I was having this conversation with Anne yesterday, that rather than trying to do like mass push alerts at scale on WhatsApp, which everyone knows painfully you can't do, um, but if you focus on the sort of the nodes within WhatsApp who have the right contacts, then that can work really effectively. Another example was with the Zika virus. Mm -hmm. um, our BBC Brazil service wanted to um, try and produce a slightly lower level version of what we did with the Ebola WhatsApp news service a, a year or so ago, which um, was aimed at trying to push public health information to people in West Africa. But it required a lot of resourcing because WhatsApps, you, you can't really push it at scale very easily. So rather than trying to replicate that very laborious process, what um, the Brazil service did was that they pulled together a list of about 200, 300, 400 contacts that they had built relationships with who were sort of doctors, um, ex um, medical experts in clinics um, or community leaders who all had uh, an interest in the Zika virus and combating the Zika virus. And they just targeted those groups to push out content to, knowing that that would then be spread much more virally through all their contacts. And that became a much more effective way of engaging with them and getting a lot of really useful content back as a result. 
Um, if I could, if mm -hmm. I, I could add as well, I think you know this um, this larger you know when, when thinking about interacting with brands, um, you know to to your point, Trishar, is, um, is you know the the trend of towards journalists being their own brand, I think, is part of this, is that people are more likely to trust a person um, or interact with a person than with a, a faceless brand. Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, uh, again, going back to WeChat, the, um, you know, there, there's also this trend of journalists setting up their own private WeChat groups um, or broadcast groups and having tens of thousands of followers because, um, you know, the trust in the brand, especially in a context like China, but certainly um, in, in, um, with, with many brands, is it's difficult to relate to a brand, but easier to relate to a person within that large context and so um, and so you know this um, as as journalists join join these networks I think um, it'll be easier to to know that oh yeah I can trust this journalist for this topic versus that journalist for that topic rather than trying to say okay I'm just gonna have a relationship with this organization um, it helps to have a face that um, people can relate to and that people can actually follow as well for further updates um, on, on all personal matters and and I think you know some of the more effective community journalists who are doing this even in open networks are the ones who you know are happy to share silly videos Videos, um, you know, build those bonds um, you know, longitudinally, um, such that when, when news is breaking or when there's more, um, you know, more, um, you know, uh, more serious news to discuss, um, that um, that relationship has been built over time. And you know, to that to that degree of, of yeah. kind of how you are connecting in an easier fashion and it's more trustworthy to be individuals, it, it kind of underscores also that working in these uh, these private messaging groups. That it's harder to scale internally too. That's not something that you can easily centralize. Um, and you can have a BBC account, but yeah, you're still going to have all of these threads out there that are going to be very effective when you have reporters doing that. I know for our newsroom, you know, we have a WhatsApp number, but it's on a device that sits in Ireland when not all of my staff is in Ireland. So sometimes it's like, oh, we really need to get onto the WhatsApp. Well, let me call somebody in Ireland to wake them up, to go and check that device, <laughs> and. They don't like getting that phone call, by the way. <laughs> but, but you know, they, it is hard to centralize something like that. And then when you do have you know staff out there doing this themselves, you know that's something that's going to be built in to their network then, which is ha so sometimes hard to put all together into one larger family network. All of these little circles that each person has. So it's it's something that's a little bit more of a logistical challenge from a management perspective to do something like that. But it's certainly going to be worthwhile if you can build up all of those little circles along the way to make something bigger. Well, part of the work that the First Draft News Coalition looks at is the ethical aspects involved when you're trying to verify content, as you all know. Is there anything unique when it comes to verification or the ethical aspects specifically for closed networks that your teams in Dublin and elsewhere don't think about as much on the traditional social media platforms? Well, I think something that we have to consider on all platforms, but I think is especially notable for the closed networks, is the intended audience that they were sharing something with. That they, people were not necessarily planning to make this a broadcasted effort. You know, if they're sending it to a group of friends or to a group of colleagues, and then it gets bigger, it gets passed along, it gets to this place or this place, maybe it breaks out on Twitter later on. You know, for us, when we're tracing that line back, you know, when you're finally getting to that conversation point, that's one of the key things about finding that original person is that's when you can figure out, did they know how big this could get? Is this something they want out there? And then when we find them, is this something that they want their name on? You know, they might want to be anonymous. This might be a situation where they don't want anyone to know. You know, speaking of the shins and explosions, you know, that was where we found a lot of content on, on Weibo that was actually originally from WeChat tracking people down and even once we found them they didn't want their names on anything they didn't want to get in trouble you know if they don't want to be associated with it and if it had stuck with what was put out on Weibo for one thing we would have named the wrong person because they didn't own it but also that person could potentially have something come back on them because they would think they're connected with this so it's really about considering the intent and considering their privacy and considering you know their safety when it comes into something like that because the um, closed networks, often they're associated with phone numbers, does it make the whole process much quicker, actually, or not? For me, uh, yeah, so the example I mentioned earlier about the fact that you can at least get hold of people who've sent you stuff much quicker is really helpful. The other thing is part of the verification is, you know, you can tell country codes from mobile numbers. And so if, you know, it's a Nepal earthquake and you're getting a number that's, a Nepal, you know, pre-code, uh, pre then you know that there's a good chance that that person probably is in the country. 
Um, and it's also been quite useful for us just to be able to, once we start building up our own sort of list of contacts that have sent us stuff in the past from WhatsApp, um, some of our team, the program teams in particular, so we've a, a global program called World Have Your Say on the BBC World Service, um, and they often want to engage with specific audiences in countries or regions that they're doing debates around, and so whenever they get contacted via WhatsApp, they'll make sure that that number is saved in the right sort of country group. Um, and so whenever they want to do shout outs uh, around those countries, you know, they've got a big uh, audience potentially already there that can reply back to them instantly. So th in those cases, mobile numbers have pr proved to be really, really useful. And it's helpful too, at least in WhatsApp, that you can also see when someone has checked a message. So that yeah, you know that exactly. they've come back exactly. in and they've yeah. seen that. Yeah. Makes it very hard to, to hide from you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why your employees can't hide from you then. Like, <laughs> I know you saw that. <laughs> but it's, it's really nice for doing outreach to, uh, to, to people who are users as well, because in that case you can see, they saw my message, they might not be in a position where they can answer this yeah. right now, but at least they, they know yeah. I'm trying to contact them. And the numbers can make it a lot easier. You just might have to make more than one call. Yeah. If someone sent you something directly, that's great, but if uh, you're getting something through groups, yeah, it's again, call and then a call. It's playing a little bit of telephone to get back yeah. to uh, the original person. One other interesting, and I can't say it's a significant trend, but sometimes it's proven to be quite useful using emojis as a way of communicating with people who don't speak your language. Right. Um, and so, because it's almost becoming like a universal language. Um, and so if it's like a very basic thing that you're trying to ask someone, sometimes as well as asking them in English, some of our teams, if it's appropriate obviously, they'll try and use the right emojis alongside it okay. as well as Come an additional way of trying to... Which convince. emoji works the best for BBC News <laughs> and um, which one should we all be using? Well, no, it's not so much the smiley faces and so on, but, you know, you, you, the smiley more... Smiley wink. <laughs> crying cat face. Maybe, I'm maybe, sure that works. Maybe, well, well, it's like, you know, all the different sort of activity type of emojis, right. whether it's planes and, you know, cars and all this sort of stuff. Um, and actually, you can construct quite useful messages using those types of emojis. Um, and that's proving, no, I, I can't say any huge scale, but in certain instances, we've noticed that that's been quite a useful way of just getting a message across to people. Okay. I, I can imagine, just to just, just throw in really quickly, emoji is also a way of, of saying, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm part of this culture. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's friendly. Um, if, you exactly. know, if you know like, how to use the emoji well, if it doesn't yeah. come across really stilted, yeah. um, it's such an embedded <laughs> part of digital culture. If yeah. you can put in that right gift for emoji, yeah. I can imagine that, that builds uh, that relationship really yeah. well. Okay, lots and lots of issues there. Um, now it's time for some questions from the audience whilst you get ready. Um, just a couple of things on Twitter. Richard Kendall, who's a product manager at Johnson Press, answering the question, does the rise of closed networks spell the end for social news gathering? He says, uh, you can't fight the audience if that's where they decide to go in enough numbers, constant change. Uh, Julia Bayer, who's a social media journalist at Deutsche Welle News, uh, says on Twitter, the rise of closed networks will make it more difficult, but we have to use and connect to our digital network more actively. Okay, so any other questions in the room? Yes, sir. I think we have to wait for a microphone, just in the middle there. If you can say, um, sir, when we get to you, your name and where you're from. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Omar Mohammed. Uh, I'm from Tanzania, uh, and I'm a night fellow. Um, I, I was just curious, I know we're talking about news gathering, I was just curious about how uh, these closed networks, are, what are news organizations doing uh, with these new, uh, closed networks as uh, platforms for distributing content? Okay, so we talked about how they're used as news gathering, but how do you distribute your content? So we, we've done some experiments with WhatsApp in the past, but um, I very... Um, I'm clear that WhatsApp isn't really used as a distribution platform at scale. It's not. Um, it's not because it's just not engineered and built that way. And I don't think that's going to change, certainly in the near future. But other platforms do work much better. So, uh, for example, uh, WeChat or Line um, or Telegram, they all have um, very good capabilities of being able to set up sort of official uh, brand presence or publisher presence on their platforms. It, it, the whole subscribing to those accounts are automated and so you can just focus on the content and just pushing out that content. Um, in Africa it's tricky because WhatsApp is pretty much the only platform that anyone uses. Um, WeChat is beginning to grow in parts of uh, the country, I think potentially Tanzania as well. Uh, Line is trying to grow in, the, uh, in Africa as well. I think one of the most significant things is going to be Facebook Messenger. Um, it seems to be an open secret that at F8 in a couple of weeks they're going to open up an API uh, 
for Messenger, and I think they're going to be opening it up to publishers as well. Um, and so potentially using Messenger as a mass distribution tool, uh, you know, that possibility opens up. I think people have to think very carefully about exactly how that would be used and what the benefit would be to users. Um, but as an alternative to not being able to do the same thing on WhatsApp, I think Messenger could be the next best thing. Um, you know, speaking to a little bit more to, to WeChat um, as a as a more it's a broadcast, um, you know, sites like uh, BuzzFeed and Vice News and um, and arts magazines, um, WeChat is more you know again more than a messaging platform. So you can actually create a mini site within um, within WeChat um, with navigable buttons and and you know different verticals within. So um, the BuzzFeed one is a good example where you can see the life section, the news section, all within all within WeChat. Um, and then um, uh, another other messaging apps that are um, you know another, another one that it makes me think of is Snapchat. Um, which, uh, which is also, um, they work with very approved brands um, to, um, who, who then create you know, dedicated sites, um, dedicated uh, you know, uh, accounts um, there where people can subscribe and, and watch you know, Snapchat specific content, that you know, vertical video with kind of poppy feel and, um, and more interactive um, that, um, that people can access. Um, the limitation there um, that's different from WeChat, I would say, is um, with Snapchat, you, you must be an approved brand. You have, to, you have to have a relationship with Snapchat to have that kind of broadcast relationship. Um, so this, um, this does um, put some, um, you know, some more power into the hands of, of networks rather than, than brands, um, which I think is part of a larger trend, um, but it's some, something to be aware of. And, um, and again, so each, each network has its own personality, and th those are the two that I'm most aware of in terms of broadcast. I think um, for us, you know, we don't publish externally because we're publishing to specific newsrooms we work with. But uh, in that sense, Slack has actually been a really huge, uh, huge development for us because not only using it internally as a company, but using it to talk to other companies and to distribute our content to the newsrooms that we're working with. So, you know, building a Slack hook, uh, which I, sounds like such a weird <laughs> thing, but it, it is a thing, a, a Slack web hook where, you know, a user on the other end, you know, maybe they're in, in another newsroom halfway around the world, they can be connected in to our newsroom with that. And we can be talking on Slack, direct messaging, but also talking in groups. So during big breaking stories, we can actually get right into their newsroom and beamed in to sort of say, this is what we know, this is how we can help, what do you need? They're asking questions, really being able to have more of that conversation, but also as soon as we've published and verified a piece of social content, we can push that out to them in mass of anyone who has that Slack hook built in, but also on that individual basis with the people that we're talking to. And that's something that's been really interesting to see news organizations play around with that. Um, I know of at least one, and there's probably several that do this, but um, Billy Penn, which is a, a local site, it's like a millennial and mobile focused site in Philadelphia, they used an open Slack, completely open in the community, where they have invited the community in to a Slack group. Like you, it's kind of like your workplace, but just a whole city. And so that way they can build these small groups, all essentially little committees that are interested in certain topics, but also have that one-to-one -one direct messaging contact with people in their community. So I thought that was a really interesting experiment too, that it's using a network that's somewhat become more professionalized in a more casual setting, but also for community building like that. Do you think that um, breaking the boundary between the audience and the news provider, does that put you three at more risk of being tripped up deliberately? I mean, I, that could certainly happen. I mean, but that can happen in, in any aspects of journalism over time, that you have sources that you've come to rely on or people who've been, you know, your fixer or the person that has been your in to certain, uh, certain organizations and certain stories that if they want to, they have enough power that they could, they could turn on that if they wanted to. And it's about, you know, essentially finding those networks you can trust too as a journalist. Okay, any other questions in the room? There's one at the front there. Hi guys, uh, it's a question around encryption actually. So Telegram and WhatsApp make some very uh, strong promises around encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, encrypted calls, etc. Um, looking at those of you who work in newsrooms, are those promises things that you're confident to trust when it comes to protecting anonymous sources, protecting whistleblowers, um, handling sensitive information, or, or do, you, do you nurse any healthy mm -hmm. caution? I mean, I think there's always a little bit of caution we have to exercise, but um, we certainly 
tend to be more comfortable if we're talking to people on those sorts of platforms than just by regular email, for example. Um, and where we can, we'll try and move them onto a more secure uh, platform. And I guess it depends on what the actual story is. If it's like a super sensitive story, someone you know, in Syria um, will try and just get them on the most secure platform that they can. Um, but you know, we also have to be aware that you know, it has to be within the capabilities of what they can do. Um, and if it's, you know, particularly now WhatsApp, where I think the confidence increases further that the messages won't be able to be intercepted because of the end-to-end -end encryption that they introduced uh, you know, earlier in the week. Um, but obviously, it's not a 100% fail-safe, but it, it's mainly just a sort of a constant assessment that we have to make uh, against the pros and cons of, the, of this sort of stuff. Right. Uh, there's not, I can't really add much more than that, but you know, I think that for one thing, if there really is, you know, the safety of the, of the uploader in, in place with that, then there, there really might not be a place that's 100%, but it's picking, it's picking your battles of the places that you feel that you can trust. I mean, with WhatsApp getting into an encryption now, I think that's going to change a lot of that. There's some custom options out there. It was one I was just trying to think of what the name of it is, but there's a there's a messaging app where everything, dis like not only like on Snapchat where it disappears, but you can't even see the text or anything that's in it unless you have your finger on it and you only see little corners of it that it's so, you can't even take a screenshot of it. It's what it's for is to not even be able to do that. Does that make it useless for news gathering? Well, it's good for information. Right. right? You can't, you know, Tip it's going to disappear, but you know, if someone really wants to protect their identity, it's an ideal app for that. I think it was called Reveal think is the name of that. It's a very, it's a small app, but it's really effective for sharing information. It's used a lot in, in military settings. Okay. And I guess I just, well, if I can add just yeah, one, one more thing to the, the encryption and, and safety is, uh, and this is just a more, more broad point, is that um, you know, beyond encryption, there are other forms of safety that we need to consider with sources and that, um, you know, just one anecdote working with, uh, you know, at least listening from stories from Vietnamese activists is I'm sure you can encrypt Skype, um, but, uh, you know, if people can listen through the walls. Um, so. Um, you know, when we're thinking about safety of sources, um, it's, it's just really critical that we think past um, you know, the encryption and think about physical security, other modes of security that, um, that people might be facing in other contexts. One thing I'd just very quickly yep. to add to that is that um, we try and think, okay, what happens if someone's phone is confiscated or seized by an authority? Um, and so where we do have these sorts of communications with people, we try and get them to make sure that they don't save our contact as BBC News, but something random. So it's not obvious to someone who, you know, if their phone is seized, that they don't see that, you know, this person that they're talking to is, is named as BBC News, mm -hmm. but something a bit more random just has added a little bit of extra security. Great. And another question, please. Hi. Um, that was a really interesting panel. Thanks very much. Um, I had a question for Anne, actually. Um, I found the concept of the digital fixer really interesting. Sure. Um, and I was sort of comparing it in my mind to the kind of traditional fixer that you have. Um, and I was wondering, how it is so you know with a traditional fixer they are physically located in that place they hang out there they make contacts just through kind of going to places and hanging out so when someone comes into town and says i need you to introduce me to someone who can you know who's in this area or whatever they can find it and i was wondering how it's possible actually to have that kind of overview and visibility into all these sort of very specialist closed communities um, for a digital fixer um, I, you know, when I, I'm reflecting on when I was um, younger and using AOL Instant Messenger, I would have, um, um, you know, my, my parents would look over my, my shoulder and, and see me with like 10 windows open and think I was totally, totally crazy. Um, and, um, you know, digital fixtures, you know, I'm, and they didn't call themselves this, but people who I've worked with who've introduced me to digital contexts are this, that sort of person who is, you know, literally they're scrolling through and she, um, she had like dozens, dozens and dozens of groups that she's actively monitoring. Um, and, and engaging, not just monitoring, but engaging with. She, you know, she's just getting all those things. They just have a very high tolerance and, and uh, literacy and fluency with these digital spaces that they're, they're happy to navigate them. So um, it is, um, it's, a, it's a special skill. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Um, and, um, and some people have um, more comfort and fluency with, with, these, with these spaces. And so um, she's constantly cultivating new groups. Um, she's often working with them. Um, she's a journalist herself, so she's, um, uh, so she's just doing reporting herself. Um, and so, um, but she, um, she just has that level of comfort. And, um, and so I, I don't think just anyone who's, who's comfortable with digital spaces can do this, but people who have a, um, a particular um, knack for, um, for high tolerance for messages and things like that. Sure.
she would presumably be following groups in China or whatever. Yeah. Um, or w might that sort of open up possibility for sort of thematic digital yeah. fixes, like yeah. I guess people who follow all the groups that are to do with manufacturing unrest or whatever? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, again, it depends on the context. Um, you know, a lot of, um, and I'll speak specifically to manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing culture um, in China is, again, built on physical trust. So um, the digital networks and the physical networks tend to intersect. Um, but if you wanted to do a global story about um, how, how um, objects are traded from Shenzhen all the way to Mombasa, um, you know, um, then you'll have a more thematic focus, and, and those networks might look more global. So um, again, it depends on the network, and, and I think you're absolutely right, though, that um, the internet does allow for transnational um, you know, borderless networks, and so people who are comfortable with that sort of navigation um, you know, um, can, can enter those spaces and, and help you, you know, meet them. Okay, one more question here, then one at the back, and then we're done, I think, sir. The microphone at the front, please. Yeah. Uh, actually, it has a button. Um, I have one question about active data. So, um, um, is our closed networks actually delivering you more active data as Twitter, for example, and um, to help you in your verification processes? That's interesting. What support do you get from using WhatsApp? Because you mentioned that maybe they're not best designed for news distri distribution, but what support do you get and what, to the gentleman's point, what analytics do you get back from them? Um, well, they're basically none. <laughs> um, all the exit, exit data is stripped from all these closed networks. So um, I'm, I don't think I've come across a closed network unless Anne knows more that doesn't strip exit data. I mean, WhatsApp certainly does. Um, Telegram does, I think. So yeah, it's really difficult to get that sort of information. Even you know, Twitter, you know, Facebook. I think they all strip yeah. exit data, right, Mandy? So yeah, it's, that's really tricky. It would be a wonderful world if exit data was included on these. It would make verification so much easier. And for, for us, a lot of the time, even if we did get something through, whether it's from a closed network or an open one, getting the original is going to be really the only way to get access to that. And on uh, Medan products, we've added like fields because of this problem when people are adding videos. We've added metadata fields so they can manually add after doing their own manual verification efforts to supplement that. Thank you. One last question at the back, please. Yes, hi. Um, I was thinking when you, when you were talking about how you interact with people on these um, messaging platforms and closed networks and you know, cultivating um, groups and you, you communicate using emojis and things like that. So it's sort of, it's really informal. And the way that we all use these apps, I would think is a lot more informal than what we write in an email, what, how we talk on the phone with a source. So I'm just wondering, how does that change the interaction between journalists and sources? Mandy. Oh, I think um, it, it can be more casual, and I think that's a good thing. It makes you seem more like an actual human instead of like a journalist human. <laughs> what? And I know, it's crazy. <laughs> but um, I, I think that that can be really helpful for that because you can sort of be more yourself. But I think, you know, it's still about finding, as ever in the work we're doing, you know, fi finding the line before getting too close to that. But, you know, I think it is something that makes you more trustworthy. Okay, so we started this session an hour ago with the question, do closed networks spell the end for social news gathering? We're gonna ask you to vote in a very technological way with your hand. Uh, so I'm gonna ask the question, uh, the answer you can have is yes, not yet, but it will, or no. This is the scientific poll we've conducted online. 32 people have voted, a bit short of the 2,000 we'd normally prefer, hey? But as you can see here, 56% say no, 28% not yet, but it probably will, sorry Mandy, and 16% yes. Uh, so, in the room, uh, do closed networks spell the end for social news gathering? Put your hand up if you think yes. Oh, oh we, we got one. We got one. one. We got one. Was that a mistake or itching your head? Uh, not yet, but it will. One, two, three, four, five, six. No. Okay, there we Still go. Got it, Still got it. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the laptop screen, please. Okay, uh, this has been a presentation and a discussion brought to you by the First Draft News uh, Coalition. As I said at the beginning, there are eight events taking place that have been produced by the team here in Perugia. You can find out much more on firstdraftnews.com. They've also got loads going on there in terms of online resources when it comes to verification and the ethical questions we've kind of touched on today. Um, but on Mandy Truchart, 
if we can thank them very much for coming today. Thanks. And then um, I've been asked to very politely ask you to thanks for coming and vacate because the next session is coming in in about four minutes time. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Matt. That was great. That was great.